please. Okay, so uh, Mangarani. So, um, so there's there's two words that kind of get tossed around. One, of course, is relevant. Okay, and I think that's that's important that the the topics are relevant to the students' experience. Okay, uh, but maybe more important than relevant is authentic. You know that what we're talking about is is real and authentic and uh, not simple a kind of, well, this is convenient for teaching a certain idea or a certain uh, aspect of English skill, but it's really something of interest and importance in, in young people's lives, you know? So, um, so that's one thing, and that can be uh, at any age level, you know, and this is from when I was teaching kindergarten, junior high, or people who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, was to find things that are of interest. So one of one reason for that, of course, is motivation. It's hard to maintain motivation just for a grade, you know, just because, well, I have to do this because uh, to pass the course, um, but motivation for the sake, I want to know about this. I want to learn about this. So it's possible to have um, some of my university classes, um, which I've been teaching the last several years, mostly undergraduate university, um, that uh, there would be my part of the, the uh, syllabus that was set, but there would be a corner of the syllabus for student uh, suggested topics, you know, so that students had a sense of, of uh, and they would brainstorm about things they would like to learn about. And then I would work that into my curriculum. So it gave them a sense of ownership in, in the curriculum. So that that's one one aspect, it's motivational, okay? Another thing that I have used, um, and I'm just gonna open the, um, let me do this quickly here. Uh, I'm gonna open the chat if I can. Okay, so uh, that's what's called- uh, You can share. Learn. Ah, okay, can I share the screen? Yes, Great. you can do it. Okay. So I'm going to put up the whiteboard here a second. Everybody can see. Okay. So there's that's what's called a learner learner negotiated. Uh, I'm not spelling syllabus. Okay. <laughs> learner negotiated. So this is where. Um, the students have some input into the content of the class. So, of course, the teacher, and in a secondary school, of course, teacher, and you probably have certain requirements of your school district or of your state has certain curriculum requirements, and we, you should teach this, this, and this at this age level. However, if you can keep back a, a small corner of your syllabus where the students can actually suggest some topics or some uh, types of vocabulary that they're, they're, they say, we want to talk about something, we, we don't have the English to do that. And so you could have, you know, just a small corner, even if it's five minutes of a lesson, where this is something that that was a request from the students that can give them such high motivation, you know. So that's one thing that I have used a lot. Another thing is something that is uh, this is something that I I could do a whole um, whole session on this, but reciprocal teaching method is something that was developed in the US, yeah, I think back in the 1990s or so, but it's, it's a process where um, 
students are and the teacher is involved in this kind of dialogue where the, the students uh, are asked to like predict what is coming up. So you see the title of, of something they're going to read, but before you see the whole reading, to try to predict what do you think this is going to be about just from the title. So there's predicting, there's summarizing. So after reading something, so just tell me in one or two sentences about this, okay? Um, there's also uh, clarifying, like was there some part of this that you, what part did you not understand? You know, And this gets over kind of, um, feeling of uh, embarrassment. Oh, I didn't understand the whole thing. Or maybe it was just one sentence or one word, but to freely tell uh, how that. Uh, then the fourth part of reciprocal teaching uh, is all about um, questioning, okay? So there's pre uh, predicting, summarizing, Okay, there's also uh, clarifying. The last one is questioning. This is where the students themselves make up study questions. So usually we think that the teachers make the questions, the students answer them. Um, by Especially by senior high school, the students have been asked questions so many times they know. So, so how to take a, maybe one sentence in the reading, how could we convert that into a question? You know, so at first you, you have to teach the, you know, how English works in terms of question construction, but eventually they, and, and, and when it becomes a little bit of a game where they're going to make a question and then ask another team or another group about it. So, um, so they found these, these are four kind of cognitive activities that we, we all do in our minds when we're reading uh, in our first language, you know? But they found out we could teach these as strategies to, um, Originally, it was for students with learning difficulties, but they found out all students can benefit. And I've, this teaching method is something I have used at every level from, um, you know, from junior high up through my graduate students. And uh, it's been very, very effective because it's a very active learning approach. And maybe one day, I wouldn't have them do everything. Maybe just today we're going to work on how to summarize, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, but the, the questioning at first, they all go, they're all like, oh, this is real. I can't do this. This is so difficult. And then once they're shown the way, and then it's like, oh yeah, I can. Yeah, I can make a simple question, you know? And it becomes fun. And then they try to make, a more difficult question to try to stump the other students. And, and that's a kind of healthy kind of, uh, yeah, that's a healthy approach, you know, to competition, you know, that's, yeah. So those are, those are some things that I've used across the age span, you know. Very nice. Thank you, sir. Nice. Thank you so much. Really, it's a wonderful method, sir. We also we are going to implement this in our classrooms. Oh, good, good. And there's many lovely, um, on the YouTube, there's some lovely examples of reciprocal teaching. And you can see it in action in some school systems. And uh, thank you, sir. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. You, it's my pleasure, ma'am. So any more questions from our participants? Yes, sir. This is Madhavi. Ah, oh, please. So I would I would like to interact with uh, Mr. Professor. Yes. Sir, very good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Japan. Good, af good, good afternoon. Good morning, India. Yeah, uh, it's two two twenty five in the afternoon here. So, 
very glad to meet you uh, just a single click i got uh, much information about you uh, very glad to be here and associated with you a wonderful educationist today thank you and uh, i found two interesting facts in japanese education system mm. uh, one is uh, uh, japan uh, it's a wonder japan has the one of the world's best educated populations with mm -hmm. 100% enrollment right and mm. one more interesting fact which is 10% of japanese have 130 iq comparatively ah. it's just 2% uh, in america mm. so what are the secrets behind <laughs> how you are managing the inclusiveness uh, all countries suffering uh, these kind of issues mm. including india so how are you managing the inclusiveness in your classrooms and how, what is the secret behind that japanese have their iq in such a way right very glad to hear from you sir yeah i think so, so uh, a little bit about that the iq thing is a bit i think it's a bit of a mystery to many people um my my understanding of iq um is is not that it's a um what should i say it's not something people are born with okay i think uh, iq everyone has maybe a kind of a baseline level you know um but that uh certain kinds of activities can uh encourage that okay so um you know what does iq measure that's still um uh, that's still a big question among uh, psychologists um we do know that um japanese people are very good at taking tests okay <laughs> the school system is very uh, structured around test 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 so it becomes a part of everyone's uh everyday kind of activity is okay there's always going to be a test so i think uh there is a kind of orderliness of people trying to uh keep information in an orderly way uh that they can access so i think that what what the iq measures in japan maybe is the kind the educational system is very good at developing certain kinds of thinking that does put people uh at an advantage at taking uh tests okay the the other so there's always you know it's always two sides to one coin the downside of japanese education is the sense of creativity and the sense of um being able to come up with a novel solution you know they're being able to say i'm not sure but maybe you know the idea of brainstorming and coming up with a partial solution that is is very um threatening to many japanese adults you know and so there because in school they were always looking for the one right answer not several interesting possible answers you know so so the there is the um, what do i say one of the hazards of the schooling system here which does result you know the schooling system does prepare people well for certain kinds of jobs in adult life and certain kinds of things um it it hinders them somewhat in the things of just brainstorming and sort of creativity based now the other side is many of the people who are very you know creative artists creative uh, you know amazing um music and dance and theater and visual art and all um a lot of those people did not do very means, well in school uh, uh, in your education system we will give more importance for vocational uh, subjects right right yeah so so many people uh report that uh a, a lot of the very 
people in the creative arts often were people who were somewhat misfits in school. They, they, didn't, uh, they didn't do so well in all of the subjects and the math and the tests and all that. And the, the creative arts were kind of their outlet, you know? And so then they excelled in that. Uh, maybe that's not only in Japan, you know? Uh, Picasso is said to have, have had um, great trouble in concentrating in school. And his teacher was very wise. At least this is the story it's told. Picasso was always kind of staring at the window or not. And his teachers, you know, was very frustrated and you're not paying attention. And, and he told, he said, I have a pet dove at home and I love, he said, okay, bring your pet to school. And the teacher let Picasso uh, keep the dove in a little box and said, whenever you feel like your mind is wandering, you can talk to your dove, okay? And then found that he would come back, you know, and then concentrate on school. Later, he, he did some beautiful sketches of his dove. So I'm thinking like, um, Sometimes it's finding out how does a student learn, you know, how does uh, that, that aspect also the Japanese system in, I think, element, uh, elementary school and in uh, kindergarten, the child's individual abilities are, are very much um, honored, you know, as it goes on, it becomes more and more um, you know, again, it's very, it's so driven by the uh, entrance exams uh, come to sort of make every decision about uh, content and uh, way of teaching. So anyway, that's, uh, so there are a number of uh, alternative schools. Uh, there, the uh, Montessori school, uh, there are a few, uh, the Steiner, Waldorf schools, there are a few. There's also Japanese version of uh, sort of alternative education, students who have different styles of learning that the public schools or the, you know, the high pressure private schools uh, maybe can't. So the diversity of learning style is, is um, honored, but it's usually uh, outside of the uh, standard schooling. So, um, so anyway, education here is a very fascinating topic and it's, it's discussed a lot, you know, the Ministry of Education um, is, I think, doing their best, um, but we're hoping that each school system is given a little more freedom in adapting, you know, the rural schools, and the urban schools um, sometimes need some different approaches. And, um, and uh, one more. Uh, oh, please, at primary level, mm. at primary level, uh, mm. do you prefer uh, to use the discourse in uh, mother tongue or in English? Okay, so um, in my experience, um, the concept of bilingual education is very good um, because the you know the the children are still forming they're, you know they're, and the formation of their mother tongue is a very important concept you know um, and cognitively uh, for the students to have strong base in their mother language um, but the, um, what should I say? Primary age is, is a very critical period for learning a second language, you know? And in the case of India, where uh, for many people, uh, it's necessary to have two first languages, you know? So the, the uh, regional language and also the, uh, you know, interlanguage of English for, for between, the different states and all different uh, ethnic groups. So uh, my, my belief has become, and the research seems to be pointing this out, that bilingual education, uh, 
So where the teachers uh, can fluidly work between. Maybe there's a, a section of the curriculum or of the student's day that is only taught in the mother tongue and a section of the day, a course or two that is only in the target language. There seems to be some um, wisdom to that. You know, the, um, the immersion school system where uh, kids are thrown kind of directly into nothing but the uh, target language um, seems to work for some kinds of kids. And certainly um, kids that have like lived abroad and are living in a context like international school uh, in a foreign country, it seems to work. But uh, that new language is all around them, you know. So, uh, but I, I, will, I think the future um, is really with bilingual education where both languages are honored in the same school. So how much extent that you will give freedom to children at primary level in classrooms? Okay, uh, what, one more time. Uh, the, the, I couldn't hear. How much, is, how much extent that you, uh, that you will give freedom to children at primary level in classrooms? Ah, okay, so, so. Um, a, a rule of thumb to me is, you know, if a child is in, addressed in one language, I'm going to use this as an example, their uh, obligation is to respond in that language. So when I speak to a child in English, I expect to them respond to me in English, you know. I, when, um, you know, so, so that I think is the, that is a kind of social learning of courtesy. Where if, if you are in a, a culture where there are several languages being used, then if someone addresses you in a certain language, the courtesy is to respond, the discourse in that same language. So that's on the language level. In terms of freedom, um, ch children's general freedom in elementary schools, uh, I personally, I don't, I, I do not have children myself, however, I've always thought if I did, I would probably enroll them in a Montessori school <laughs> because I, I believe the Montessori system, which allows the young children to make many decisions about, um, I'm going to work on this activity now and I'm going to cooperate with my uh, fellow student. And then I'm going to work on another activity. So that kind of, of a classroom where the child can make many decisions. So the child has like a checklist over the day. You should do work in this area, this area, and this area, but the order you can decide. And then there's days that are more structured. So uh, reason is I believe that builds uh, self-discipline and self-reliance on the part of the student. So particularly at elementary school, the I have a lot of faith in what I've seen. How that kind of student then transitions to a more structured classroom, that takes a lot, you know. So if they move to junior high and have to be, then those students need some special care. But anyway, uh, I, I've seen really great things come out of that uh, approach. So I don't know, Montessori schooling, I think, is has some currency in in India. I've heard. I had a couple of student graduate students from India, and one of them had grown up in Montessori schools. Mm. Very nice, sir. Yeah. Yes, thank you yes. so much, sir. And thank you uh, to all my colleagues for being in the discussion, oh. and uh, thanks uh, oh. a lot for Hari Krishna sir for giving me this opportunity. Nice. Nice. And uh, at the end of at the end of the session. Uh, I would like to hear a humming from you as a music oh. teacher. <laughs> oh, okay. So <laughs> what, um, let me think. So, um, so something, uh, I, I know what I'll, I'll tell you about is how um, 
when I was using music in the classroom, and I'm not sure how the music is going to sound over uh, Zoom yeah. here, but uh, what I construct, constructed for the kids was a kind of series of dialogues. So um, I would come in the uh, classroom and my greetings to them. Hello, everybody. How are you? How are you? So I, I had greetings to them and they would say, uh, hello, Mr. Oh. Morgan. How are you? How are you today? You know, well, nice. well, well, I'm Very just nice. fine, thanks. And then, then we'd move on, how's the weather? And then they'd have to respond, it's wow, sunny, so. how's the weather? Or it's rainy. So, and I would have like uh, cards to hold up, you know, and I would teach them about the weather. So everything was taught. Uh, this was about a 40 minute lesson, but um, it would move from song to song, but every song was, um, had a teaching uh, point, uh, vocabulary, or uh, structure, and uh, so I I met some of the, those kids. They were in elementary school, uh, fourth grade. Okay, some of them became my students in university because I was teaching okay. in the same exactly. district, and I was like, "Do you remember me?" Oh yeah, you know, uh, I hadn't changed much. They had changed a lot. Uh, but they told me how it said at the time, um, it was says my English class was something they could understand. You know, uh, the songs were something that they actually, they felt they got something of use that continued through their life. So uh, I'm interested once they're adults and have their own kids, you know, but will they also have some songs with them, so. Excellent, excellent, thank, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Steven, 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 I would like to wrap up the session. And before yes. I wrap up the session, could you please sing a rhyme? Imagine, yes. yeah. that, imagine that we are all students. We are all students of your class. So, <laughs> OK. Yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. This is one rhyme. And we will follow. Okay. Repeat so, after you, sir. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, uh, yes, we will repeat after let, you. Let, yeah, let repeat us after hum you after said. you. Yeah. Okay. Let us One. do a bit of a thing to hum after uh, you. Huh. Okay. So. Um, for, for this one, I think, is one of the bestest greeting songs. So, hello, everybody. How are you? How are oh, yeah. you? How are you? Hello, everybody. How are you? How are you today? We are very fine, sir. We are very fine, sir. We are very fine. How are you? Thank you. How are you? Thank you. Lovely. Steven, thank you so much. Steven, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, sir. This has Excellent. been thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. You have this has been a great, great blessing Excellent. to me Excellent. today. Excellent. Wonderful job. And uh, I hope that uh, all of our participants uh, really enjoyed the session, so including you. Yes. So it's a real Hari sir, thank you very much for conducting <laughs> such a kind <laughs> session. Thank, thank you. you. For this wonderful interaction, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank sir. you so much, ma'am. So, Stephen, again, one more time. And uh, so, thank you so much for uh, sparing your valuable time. Uh, so, I will expect one more session. Uh, but in that session, okay. you, you have to sing almost all the rhymes. Okay. Yes, I, I, can, <laughs> I can make a session on, on some music yeah. to use in the classroom. And, Maybe no, uh, Yes. I can send a little music sheet uh, before the session for okay. people to to have by PDF. So. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, let's let's do that. Thank you, sir. Especially for primary children. Yes, yes. Primary children. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Very nice, sir. Thank you all. So thank you so thank much. You so much sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you You're so welcome. much. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.